All right, well, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Peter. We're going through 2 Peter in our Sunday school. And uh, last time we looked at the what Dr. Gray calls the salutation. And so that's the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. And in that, uh, Dr. Gray was talking about how we had in verses 2 through 4 the source of our growth in grace. And then in verses 5 through 7, there's a description of our growth in grace. And then in verses 8 through 11, there's the need for our growth in grace. And the need for our growth in grace is so that we do not fall from grace. And we talked about how one of the key verses in the first 11 verses is uh, number uh, 10. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. And that's part of that balance we see in the scripture. And that is uh, these things, meaning verses 5 through 7. And beside this, giving all diligence. There's that phrase again. In other words, work hard at, adding to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, or love. And so what he's saying is if these things that are described in verses 5 through 7 are in your life, then it is because someone is working in your life to produce that fruit. Well, who is that? Well, verse number 3 says, According as his divine power, that is the Holy Spirit of God, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And then we have something else, verse number 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so when we place our faith, verse number 2 says all of this, is through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so when we know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive that divine power. We receive the person of the Holy Spirit living within us. We then have the word of God, those precious promises that God has given us. And then as the Spirit applies the word to our lives, we see these characteristics in verses 5 and 7. And what Peter is saying here is, if you're tempted to fall from grace... <laughs> If you're tempted to leave your profession of faith in Christ, then perhaps it's because you're not born again. It's because, and so what you need to do is make your calling and election sure. And so, verse number 12 is where we pick up today. And we see in verse number 12, he says, this is the testimony of Peter himself. Verses number 12 through 18. It says here, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Now these things, these things, what are these things? It's throughout this chapter here. It's referring to verses 5 through 7. I'm going to remind you of these characteristics that ought to be in the Christian life. And I like this phrase, uh, in remembrance. We see it here in verse number 13. Yea, I think in meat are suitable, as long as, as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Here is the object that Peter has here. And that is, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, as long as I'm in this tent, what word would we use to describe that? As long as I am in this body. body. That's right. And that's what uh, you know, God sees it as. It's just a tent. It's just a temporary thing. He says, I'm going to wake you up by putting you in remembrance. Well, why did he have such a, uh, such a burden to keep reminding him of these things? Verse number 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. What is he saying is going to happen shortly when he says, I'm going to 
put off this my tabernacle. He's going to what? Die. He's getting ready to die. And the idea that Jesus said that you are going to die and you're going to be martyred for the faith was a motivator for him to keep reminding them of these truths. These truths. Look at this uh, where Jesus did that in the last chapter of John. Last chapter of John. We see uh, Peter went a-fishing and some others went with him, some other disciples. In verse number 15, And when they had died, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. You know, Jesus said elsewhere, If you love me, keep my commandments. This was Christ's calling on Peter's life. Feed the lambs. Feed the sheep. The young believers. The more mature believers. And then he says in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And in verse number 19, John explains this. This spake Jesus, signifying by what death Peter should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And so he knew, Peter knew, that he was going to be martyred for the faith. He probably knew when it talked about stretching out his hands, it was referring to a cross. And church history and tradition teaches us that, Jesus, that Peter was crucified upside down on a cross for his faith. And so here it is. I am going to keep reminding you of these things. Keep reminding you of these things. Because one day I'm not going to be here. And you need to remember these things. Verse number 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. What does it mean, after my decease? After he what? Ascends into heaven. What? Ascend, oh, die. After he dies, that's right. So this is the purpose. And this is the purpose of our lives. And that is that those that God has put in our path, we want to remind them and remind them and remind them. Remind them that they need Jesus Christ to be their Savior. So they can have the Holy Spirit. That they can have the Word of God with these promises. Remind them of these things. That these are the characteristics that Spirit-indwelt Christians have in their lives. And remind them to make their calling and election sure. And that if these things are in their lives, then they will not fall. And so this is it. This is Peter's purpose in life. This is our purpose in life as well. Any thoughts or any questions about this? Any thoughts? You know, that's one thing uh, in recent years. You know, I used to think, well, maybe I ought to switch it up in my sermons with some of these verses. Maybe I ought to come up with some new verse to, you know, reference in my sermons. But then it seems like the Lord just kind of spoke to me and said, no, just hammer them over the head with the same verses all the time. Because that is the way that the Lord would have us to do. Keep reminding them of what is important. Remind them they need Christ as our Savior. They need the Holy Spirit to give them the power to live in this life and the next. And they need to have these characteristics in their lives. And if they don't have these characteristics, make sure you're truly born again. Make sure you're truly saved. Okay. 
Verse number 16 says here, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The word fables here means myths. We're not just making up a bunch of myths. You know, in the culture that, uh, that Peter was, was preaching in and ministering in, there was mythology, whether it's Roman mythology or Greek mythology. There were a lot of myths out there. And Peter says, no, you know, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. Peter goes on to explain. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now who can tell me, when was Peter an eyewitness of Jesus in all of his glory? When did he hear this voice from heaven testifying as to who Jesus was. When was it? The Mount of Transfiguration. Let's turn back there. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. He's saying here, this really happened. I was there. I know who this Jesus is. I heard the voice. I saw him glorified. So verse 28 of Matthew 16 says, Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And some, most believe that chapter 17 is a fulfillment of that verse. It says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother and bringeth them into an high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. They saw Jesus the same way John saw Jesus at the beginning of the book of Revelation. They saw Jesus glorified the same way that Paul, if he could see, <laughs> saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. They saw him in all of his glory. They saw him coming in his kingdom as he will appear in his eternal kingdom. And it says in verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, the reason that that was improper was that Moses and Elijah were on one level and Jesus was on a higher level. He is the Son of God. And so Peter's saying, hey, it's neat. Jesus, Moses, Elijah, hey, these are all prophets. These are all great, great men. But verse number 5 says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This was probably the same cloud that overshadowed that came over the tabernacle in the wilderness. I think some people call it the Shekinah glory. <laughs> Here it is. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And it says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And so we see here in Second Peter, Jesus is risen from the dead, and Peter is sharing this account and saying, I am a witness to the glorified Christ, who he is. I heard the voice of God the Father testifying as to who 
he is. But yet in verse number 19, Peter says this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, that was a great experience I had. But we have something that's more sure and more certain than my experience. And may I say this? You know, in the Christian life, sometimes we have experiences. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you may not have had experiences yet. One experience we should have all had is experience of salvation. You know, knowing that we're sinners, feeling the burden of our sin because of the Holy Spirit of God pressing on us, knowing that we're under the judgment of a holy God, creator God, because of our sin, and knowing that Jesus died on the cross, bearing the penalty of death for that sin, and knowing that he has risen from the dead, he's a living Christ, therefore we can trust him because he's alive, and we have placed our trust in the risen Christ for our salvation. And at that moment we trusted him, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within us. The burden of sin is lifted, and we have insight into the Bible, into the Word of God, and into life that we never had, because we have that divine power that has all things that pertain to eternal life and to godliness here on earth. So that's an experience we all should have had. But he says, this experience that he had, there's a more sure word of prophecy. There's something more certain than his experience. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now what is it talking about here? Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. It's saying that you need to go to this more sure word of prophecy. And you need to listen to it and to read it until you understand and the sun rises in your hearts. That sun being the son of God, the son of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Jesus referred in this way in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We have Zacharias here, John the Baptist's father. Talking about John the Baptist here. It says, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring, or sun rising, from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So John the Baptist he came to make the path ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. He preached, repent, 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 for the kingdom of heaven is near. Turn from your sins. Acknowledge your sins. Turn from your sins. For the king of heaven, there's a use of that word, kingdom of heaven. The king of heaven <laughs> with his kingdom is near. But we see here Jesus pictured as a son rising in the sky. Over in John chapter uh, 8, verse 12, what does Jesus call himself? It's one of those verses you ought to memorize. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so what is this prophecy? That we are to read and we are to consume until we finally come to the knowledge of that son of righteousness who we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 20. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The scriptures. Now at this point, 
you know, Peter is writing, and the scriptures that they have are the Old Testament scriptures. And, uh, you know, the Old Testament scriptures prophesy of the coming Messiah. And you can read them. Places like Isaiah 53 are very clear about why Jesus came and what would happen to him and what it accomplished. And there are other places in the scriptures as well. You get the Passover and things like that. But today, I think we could expand this to say it's not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. Get into the scriptures. Study the scriptures. If you're able, read the scriptures. Back then, if you can't read, go to the synagogue. Hear the scriptures being read. And keep consuming the scriptures until the Son of Righteousness rises with healing in his wings in your heart. That is where it's at, the scriptures. And it says that the scripture is not of any private interpretation. This has two shades of meaning here. Number one, it did not originate with man. Scripture originated with God, not with man. Number two, because the scriptures originated with God, man has no right to determine what the scriptures mean. It's of no private interpretation. So, two shades of meaning here. Number one, the scriptures were given to us by God and not man. And number two, because they were given to us by God and not man, there's a certain interpretation or a certain meaning that the scriptures have. Now, the scriptures can have one meaning and be applied in different ways. I mean, the Holy Spirit does that in our lives. But there's only one particular meaning that the scriptures have as we come to the Bible. And we need to seek through the Holy Spirit to understand what that meaning is. And then in verse number 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The prophecy was not produced by the will of man. But instead, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, the Holy Spirit is called the breath of God. The word spirit and the word wind. I had my Greek scholar back there, my son Trey. He could probably come up with the Greek word for spirit and wind. But I think they're related there. You know, we sing that hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. Uh, and so the picture I get here, and the one that I always thought was good, is that of a boat. And the boat is on the ocean. And the boat is just let go, and it just goes whatever direction the wind blows it. And that is how the scriptures are written. Holy men of God, men are set apart, Men who know God, who are children of God, who are specially called, are just moved by the Spirit to write the Scriptures down. And it's kind of a mysterious thing because people who study the original languages say that uh, you can tell by the style, you know, if it's maybe Paul or John or Peter or who wrote it or Moses or whatever. And so how do you have that? Well, that's part of that mystery and that what I call the divine dance <laughs> I always talk about. And that is you have God moving on these human authors, but yet as he moves on these human authors, he picks up their accent as well. <laughs> and they have their little mark on it as well. So it's an amazing thing. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 is very much akin to this. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Inspired. That means God breathed. There's that picture, the breath of God. 
And so God was directing these holy men to write down these words. And so rather than primarily rely on experiences for our salvation and for our spiritual growth, we ought to be relying primarily on the more sure word of prophecy, the more certain word of prophecy, which is the Holy Scriptures, which are written by God. Any comments or any questions on that whole concept there? Anything? All right. So then we go into chapter number 2. Chapter number 2. And we see here the reason for these warnings. Verse number 1. And that is false teachers coming into the church. But there were false teachers also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So it says here, there were false prophets among the people. Who is the people that he's talking about here? Israel, that's right, Israel, that's right. So you have the Old Testament scriptures, which are a more sure word of prophecy, and then you have the Old Testament, and the, the, the believers in the Old Testament, you have the nation of Israel. There were false prophets in Israel, and now there are false, and you notice the change in word, teachers uh, among you. And so they come in privily, which means they, they don't announce themselves and say, hey, I'm a false teacher. You better watch out for me. <laughs> no, they come in secretly, covertly, and they bring in, ooh, and the Bible can get so strong sometimes, damnable heresies. Now, the word damnable, you see your little note if you have a Scofield reference Bible, means destructive. Destructive heresies that even bring them to the point where they deny the Lord that bought them. Now this is where I pause for a second. You know, I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus died for all people. And we see here people who deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if we not deny Christ before men as a pattern of our life, then he will do what? He will deny us before the Father. And so even these people are truly, clearly unsaved, unregenerate, not Christians, these false teachers, it talks about the Lord that bought them. Truly, Jesus died for all people. And I just, I'll leave it at that. I don't believe he just died for the elect, although it's only effective for the elect. But he died for all people. And it says that it brings swift destruction upon them. Okay, well, what's the problem? Well, verse number two. And many, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Pernicious. I like that word. I expand my vocabulary sometimes. I went to Google and I said, what is pernicious? You give me a good definition. And they said, a good definition is harmful. They come in secretly. They deny the Lord. You know, maybe they come in and say, well, the virgin birth isn't all that important. Well, the bodily resurrection of our Lord isn't that important. Well, you know, Genesis chapters 1 through 11, that's just a... That's just a, it's just a, it's just a, a parable. It's not really what really happened. You know, they come in and they, 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 they may appear very pious. They may appear to be very scholarly. But yet they have destructive teachings. And they come in and many people follow their destructive teachings. It says through their destructive teachings, the way of truth way, truth. The only word missing is life. <laughs> this is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
uh, is, shall be, evil spoken of, which means shall be blasphemed. They blaspheme their Lord. And it says in verse number 3, Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation, their destruction, slumbereth not. And so these are people who are motivated by greed. And with smooth words, they exploit you. And they will be judged. Their judgment, their destruction, or as this says, their damnation slumbereth not. It is right around the corner. And so what we'll do, we'll stop with verse number 3, and then we'll pick up in verse number 4, and we'll see that if God did not spare these, then why would he spare these false teachers from his judgment?